Barth, senior reporter with SE Magazine. Welcome to our closing keynote, Inside a Breach. In this session, uh, this session will provide us with a first-hand view of a network breach in progress. We'll examine what kinds of data adversaries are stealing versus what you are actually protecting, ways that these bad actors avoid detection, and of course suggestions on how to effectively mitigate today's threats. Our speaker today is Lance James, Chief Scientist at Flashpoint. This will be a demonstration, but then there will be some time for a Q&A uh, at its conclusion, so please feel free to participate. This is an interactive session. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to Lance, so please give a warm welcome to Lance. Right. Um, I'm Lance James. For some of you who don't know me, I'm the Chief Scientist at Flashpoint. Um, which is a deep and dark web, like kind of business risk intelligence firm. It's a uh, joke around. It's like the next Secure Works one, like five years ago, you know. But no, but um, uh, prior to that, I was uh, head of cyber intelligence for Deloitte and Touche. Yes, I made it out. I made it through with Bean counters. It was awesome, um, <laughs> and I've contributed to a lot of uh, few takedowns, including Silk Road, Crypto Locker, Spy Eye, a few others that are coming up as well. So. Um, in collaboration with law enforcement. It's kind of like a hobby, but it also becomes like fun for me. So, um, anyways, uh, a lot of people keep talking about breaches, everything fun like this, and I realized something that we keep calling them an adversary and realized we should just call them what they really are. Data is the new bacon. Content is king and currency, right? So no matter what you do in your, your job, if you work at AOL, if you work at Haymarket, if you work wherever, if you work in threat intelligence, it's all about data. Right? It is all about like content and its currency. It, what, how, the more unique it is, the better it is. And I realized something. We compete to that content, and that's how we you know, drive ourselves in our businesses. And I realized they're not adversaries, they're just competition. They just play by a little bit of a different set of rules, uh, international rules in most cases. But this is actually true. Like if I took the word kingpin and took this out and I was running a marketing and business development class and I put the word CEO in there, you wouldn't notice the difference between a normal business model right here. So. Um, so in that, though, breaking it down, it really is. I mean, we can all read, but basically, uh, there's an operational side to your, uh, I, I wanted to get before into like actually discussing the breaches. You need to kind of understand why motivators, all this other stuff, and who they are with this. And so this is kind of a breakdown of like what's actually going on and why we're seeing more and more and more and more and more breaches. And I'm even going to get to the point of why it's built up so exponentially from a sociological model. So. But this is the, the business model, the standard business model, mostly in Russia or Eastern Bloc areas for people who like tried to break into or, or who successfully broke into Target and you know things like, uh, if, it isn't, if it isn't North Korea, uh, SWIFT and bankings and things like this, all these banks that you see, all these robberies, everything like that, is this is pretty much that model. So it starts with operations, you have product managers. I usually get along with product managers, so I probably get along with this Russian guy. So senior developers, you have UI guys, because you know, nowadays it's not really in forums, it's like platforms. Every, uh, how many people use Elasticsearch in their, in their world, or at least are familiar with it, right? One, okay, two, okay, we have two technical people here, seriously? No, no, um, and then how about uh, anything Apache? Right? Anything Apache, all this stuff. Everything that we're using these days, guess what? They're using too. If it's the Rescator trading platforms underneath that, that's Elasticsearch, right? So it's kind of funny because like they're you know they're starting to use Hadoop and HDFS and all the things and you know they're big data accounts too, right? So, but basically their UIs are getting better too. I, honestly, I pick my malware based on how good it looks, but. Um, also, and they have actually, and this is no joke, they have actually anti, uh, antivirus and anti-crypting services, which is like, kind of like our virus total, but they have their own version. But I've literally seen this also in ransomware, where they'll have people try to ask if they can help do crypto audits on their ransomware, which I love crypto, and I'm happy to do an audit on your ransomware. Um, so, um, and so they also have QA departments as well. And then when you get into the exploit, exploit in R&D, they treat it as like an R&D center, right? So you're lo looking at new ones, like our new Adobe Flash one that came out today. That was probably figured out, uh, obviously, by Google, but also it's been exploited in the wild, which means someone on the exploits or in the R&D world figured that out. As I say, everything's vulnerable. You just got to wait until it actually gets discovered. So, um, and then the other side of it, we have like malware, right? So malware has been one of those prevalent issues today. Uh, and it's just constant and constant. And all it is is really just tool sets, right? But they have ma botnet masters. Just like we want resiliency and we won't, don't want to get DDoSed by a bunch of IOTs. Oh, sorry, did that happen too? So we, instead of having bulletproof hosters, we go to Akamai's and the Cloudflares and, and the Prolaxics and all that fun stuff. But it's the same concept. We need resiliency, so do they, right? 
We also need affiliations and, and make sure our, our traffic and our data is out there for people, right? So we have partnerships, right? And then we have also subject matter experts and such in, in distribution channels, and that's all this is. They just do it a little bit different way, and they call it kind of straight what it is. So um, pretty interesting stuff. But the interesting thing is that we keep hearing about information sharing. The information sharing is a way to solve this problem against all of these breaches. But I always laugh at it because of the fact by the time I got your IOCs, you already get breached, and I don't think they're going to do the same thing twice, because that's why they're called an advanced persistent threat, right? So, um, but in, in some senses, the key to defeating threats is getting into information sharing, right? The problem is, is the criminals or our competition are doing a better job at that in some ways, right? Which means that they can get on forums and they don't have to sign an NDA, right? I don't have to say, hey, let's share some information with each other. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Or like, oh, it's classified. Oh, like, well, of course I can't share it with you, right? Things like that. So we have these problems that, you know, they're not having, right? And they have honor among thieves. You will not believe this. You can buy back stuff like exploits from them. You act like your bad guy online and stuff. They have an escrow service. They'll even check it. It's like, so was good? Are you, were we satisfied? I mean, they were literally comes down to like making sure that, you know, if your reputation is bad on there, you're done, right? And some of these forums you can't even get on without about a half a million dollars in your pocket if you want exploits, you know, things like that. But, you know, when it comes to information superiority, you know, our competitors or our, you know, these criminal adversaries, um, they communicate behind the deep dark web, this is what they call it these days, I hate that term, but whatever, they behind password walls, they communicate, but they do the same thing. We do the same, we do it on LinkedIn, we do it everywhere else, they just have these other ones, but they're focused on platforms that communicate, right? The division of labor in their information sharing increases their efficiency too. There's literally like to make certain tools now or get access to tool, it's like an assembly line, they've just kind of like done it. And it's all reputation based. It is no different than the Ebays or the Craigslist of the world where there's five stars or four stars if you're a good Uber driver versus a good credit card trader, right? So, um, and there's a lot of drivers that's going on over there as well. Geopolitical competition, it's not a crime, it's, but it's a duty. Uh, safe havens, if you're not gonna get in trouble, why not, right? Uh, and advanced education systems. Uh, Russia is a very good example of that. They have, you know, they're a big fan of Borland, right? Delphi, uh, you know, and uh, you hear about Delphi when you see a lot of uh, Russian malware. But it's just because of the Borland non-Microsoft thing. That's basically, and so what's going on there is they have all this education, but, you know, they're sitting in bread lines still trying to figure out getting their, their thing going on. And by the now, there's a lot of corruption, right? So obviously, the limited opportunities are these forums are literally like jobs.com, right? Or what's the new one these days? I don't know, but uh, ninja jobs? I don't, I don't know. So, you know, and when we look at these information sharing pieces, right, it's across uh, different lines of operations. This side, which is interesting, is no different than your trading platforms of today, except that they're trading your credit cards and your, you know, money. Right, instead of the one, you know, you trading it. But basically, this is, these are set up in the very sim similar way. They're open about what they do. They have advertisers on each site. Um, you know, it takes, uh, you know, some vetting to get into a lot of these forums, things like that. And then you have the development side where you get all the, uh, the uh, exploits out there, Maza and Koru and exploit. Exploit, literally, like I said, you, you gotta have about a half a million dollars in your bank account to even get on there. So, um, you know, plus a year and a half of vetting, right? It's, it's like, these are communities that have been around for a long time, and this is the high tier right over here. And it's funny, because that high tier, by a fascinating fact, you hear enough about ransomware, that high tier Russian organizations, those ones that make a lot, a lot of money in crime, they don't like ransomware. I've heard some rap songs they even made about it called No Lockers. It was Russian, I had someone translate it for me. But basically, they said it was just, it's bad for their intellectual, because they also like to do this for somewhat of an intellectual mindset, you know, not being bored. But in their world, they, everybody thinks they're the good guy, right? So, but they think the lockers is causing attention to their world, and it's like kind of a low, if you know what I'm saying. So it's, it's kind of a, they don't, they don't like it at all. So, which is good. Makes, uh, we can share something in common with those guys. <laughs> so, make sure I have this. Okay, so you guys remember 2003? <laughs> remember we're like Citibank and Bank of America, and nothing wrong with the companies, by the way, but all the phishing emails you'd get in your inbox. Serial, 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 every freaking day. And it wasn't even that the phishing thing was that bad. After a while, you're just like, I don't know if that's the bank now, <laughs> right? And that's what you got to. You're like, in the bank's like, dang it, I'm learning, losing conversion on this, right? So, and so it like actually tipped the scales. Oh, sorry, did you take a picture? No, <laughs> there we go. So um, I felt it, it was like I was walking by. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, but basically we tipped the scales and you saw the serial campaign going on and they, all they did was get bulk mailing lists, you know, or like bulk, bulk email stuff. They'd trade those, they'd run them through, keep this, and then it's all opportunity. It's like literally why they call it phishing, you can catch, right? Now, what was interesting about that is 
why has it gone from that to like ridiculous amounts of crime since then? Like, you know, in some ways, I feel like we solved some of this, these problems. It's not like, you know, like we don't have that fishing problem anymore. We have more like spear fishing, which is a different kind of problem, and it's a big one. But the, the reason why, though, this has happened is not actually on our side to do with our technology, right, or our, our processes, or, our, or the people that we're working with and stuff. It has to do with the way their system is set up. So back in the day, when we learned about fishing, a lot of people were still learning about what was going on in the underground and, and stuff. And this was closer to when, for instance, like a lot of the stuff was coming out of Russia. It was when Russia hit, like we said, hey, you know, go Democratic, and then they hit the red lines, and they've got it, all these computer scientists out of work, right? So this kind of, like, this comes into that advanced re uh, education, but no jobs, right? So they had to create something. So in this, what happens on the forums nowadays, now that we have just this full communication system, is they start on the forums. There's an enterprise recruiter out there call him the kingpin that we did before, right? So he's, he's you know, entrepreneurial. Maybe not as technical, but entrepreneurial, right? He's got a cool idea. He wants to make a new, I don't know, new piece of malware, whether it's, you know, DDoS or something or steals more info and, you know, does all the stuff. It's got more rootkit, you know, capabilities, whatever. It's competitively out there. He wants to do that. So a developer is looking for a job, right? And so he's out there kind of on his own. And so what happens is the entrepreneur hires the developer. The developer then produces this piece of malware or this software, right, um, for, um, you know, the, the uh, recruiter. So then what happens, because there are no NDAs or sometimes no honor among thieves, the developer realizes, I can just switch my pseudonym and I can start running my own business with this technology. Why would I have to give it to an entrepreneur and take a cut when I can actually just continue making improvements on this, tell him bye-bye, disappear, and here you go, right? And guess what happens? That goes into a loop, and this guy makes a ton of money, decides he, his fingers are tired and doesn't want to code anymore, and he also starts recruiting. So this basically cycles itself into itself, and what happens is that now you just have everybody having low barrier of entry. If I want to go get ransomware today, I don't have to actually code software. I mean, literally, there's one that literally just like point click done on a website and it like makes your ransomware for you. It's like, that's how low barrier it is. Um, so, you guys remember the RSA attack, the breach? Let's start there, right? That, that one was like the big one, right? That's when like we decided, what if you do get breached? Do we talk about it? And it was a big deal that RSA made a move and said, okay, we got screwed. And it was a nation state or something like that. It was very technical attack. But what happened is, you know those serial campaigns I was talking about? The ones that phishing and stuff, you see all these criminals working on, and that's what they would do is repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, what Nation State did when this whole kind of thing came out, now Nation State's been around a lot more before that, but a lot of it was, some of it was classified activity back then, blah, 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 but it started hitting your corporations and people found out, and then, you know, it's the internet. Everybody finds out, right? So what happened though, is when the RSA breach came out, if you noticed in the news, how long did it take, the, the, how long did they have persistence in there? They had, what, 11 months they were in there before discovery? 11 months. You know, for a security company, I'm sure that's like already embarrassing, but it's, it could happen to anybody, right? So, and what they went after was like some serious like crypto stuff, right? Like it's, it's like crazy. So, but it was in the news, RSA survived, you know, but basically it was in the news and everybody was like trying to calibrate to that, right? So were the bad guys. They were like, wait, I can't. I've been robbing like banks and stuff and all the end users for like every, I have to like work my butt off to get like a, you know, $50,000 to $100,000 a month or, you know, even less in a lot of cases, depending on where you're at with the commodity uh, supply chain. But basically, I'm like, you know, these guys are finally going, how do they get there 11 months? I want persistence. And so it's actually kind of funny. So the organized criminals actually started adapting the nation state maneuvers, right? Um, this would actually animate, but this template was such a pain, I just did snapshots, sorry. But basically, what's going on though is today, you see, um, let's give an example, is Target. Target is not nation state. It was, you know, Russian, Ukrainian kind of like play here. Actually, and a lot of the trick was there was a piece of it on the criminal side of it. There was a guy literally hacking retailers and selling persistence as a service. That way, those people go in and put in their POS malware. But he literally does the hacking and says, I got something. I'm going to sell it to you. You want access to it? And then he sends a bunch of other people in there, and then it just gets crazy, right? So it's ironic. One of the pieces of kill chain actually is, is for sale. Uh, so basically, what's happened, though, is you cannot tell today. The DDoS, um, this one yesterday or last week or whatever, right? You guys, yeah, that, that IoT one, the one that's uh, DVRs. 
Uh, yeah, we got props for it. I'm totally like shaming here, but this is not the point. The point was this is one of the biggest like you know DDoSs in the history of whatever. What did the news originally say? It's got to be Russia. And then you find out it's not Russia. It's teenagers with your TV. <laughs> Literally. Um, your DVRs, your IPTV cameras, not yours really. Most of them are out of Vietnam. We, we were the ones who tracked it and identified it. But um, we've been watching this. Lizard Squad's been doing this since 2013, right? The Xbox PlayStation, that was done on an IoT system too, right? So um, there's a thing called booters. They're front ends, and these things become the service back ends, right? And booters are basically DDoS for, for hire, sale, right? So. You look at this and you go, oh my gosh, teenagers that just get in a bad mood. And you know the ironic part? They were going after a video game company. That's what they were doing. That was what the motivation was. They happened to hit Darin because it was part of the hosting of it. And of course, that knocks everything else out in line because they're teenagers and they didn't think about all that repercussion. Notice no one's coming out and claiming it right now because Lizard Squads usually would, right? So, you know, huh? Right? There's, a, there's, a, there's some teenagers like, oh my God, whoops. Right? So, <laughs> that was a bit much. <laughs> you know, so I. Let me check my birthday. I'm still, I'm still underage. <laughs> so so, uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a thing. But this is over like literally turf wars. No different than gang violence we saw in the 80s, except that the violence now is packets and swatting. And like, you know, 911 people getting called and, and sending police over your house, right? But it is the same concept as these young kids. Most of them have a messed up home life and stuff. And they get into a click and they, you know, need validation and they found power, right? That's this, right? Uh, and the problem is, is they usually don't have that skill, but as kids get older, those skilled ones start making botnet malware for IoT. And then they teach the little ones because they get power of being a mentor, right? So it's just kind of that whole like, cycle, it just keeps going. So a lot of people, we're going to now start looking at the breach, like the actual problem with the breach. So a lot of people try to look at it as, is it China, is it a teenager, or is it this, or is it that? Whether it's an inside breach, an outside breach, or whatever it is, it really comes down to what is the motivation, right? You get, anybody heard of mice prior to this conversation right now? So none of you work in the government? <laughs> okay. So mice is a concept uh, in counterintelligence, which is money, ideology, coercion, or ego. The four main motives why you would spy or do some kind of like, you know, uh, bad thing, usually spying or infiltrating information, right? If you look at Snowden, you don't all have to agree with me, but basically it was money and your ego, right? So, you know, um, but basically these usually how you lay this out. So when we're looking at, you know, your inside breaches, so let's take the DNC, for instance. There's a concept of both money, because Russia is in the business of being a company, right? Um, and then there's coercion, which is technically a form of influence, because that's where hacking is today is going, is it literally is causing kinetic influence, right? It isn't really about whether... You know, there was, it, no one's read her emails, by the way. Has anybody actually gone through any of those emails? No, they haven't. But they hear what the, the news goes with it, and you just go, ah, right? And then that's it. And that's all it takes, right? And then it just gets all chaotic, right? Well, same with the, those kids on the news. Everybody thought that. And all this stuff adds up, right? We have ego, which is internet uh, attention. I want to be famous more than just my Facebook television program I run every day and get likes on, you know, I want to do something big, right? Um, that plays a lot into also like insider threat side of things as well. Ideology. Um, Insurgency is such early days of anonymous. Now they're just douchebags. Um, but basically, you know, early days, they actually had these like beliefs and stuff that when you even read them yourself, you're like, oh, it's not bad, but you probably shouldn't do illegal stuff just to point, make a point out of it, right? But the point was, is as you see a lot of like uh, Middle Eastern uh, electronic armies, that's an ideology. It's like, you know, they have like Syrian electronic army. They would attack uh, the media to build out an influence, but these were based on their views <laughs> and their ideologies, right? So, um, so when we think about it, uh, how many people actually do like um, security research or like kind of try to keep the malware out of your thing? Well, who's responsible for that? People in here? Right. So let's read a definition. The efforts made by security teams to prevent hostile or criminal or adversarial organizations from successfully gathering and collecting intelligence against them. Is that what you guys would probably say you do? And it's funny because we call it information security, but really it's been moved over to what, you know, it's the old term is counterintelligence. That's what the definition, the nomenclature of that definition is. So today we get into what, you know, people call it cyber intelligence, but it's really cyber counterintelligence, cyber just being a domain, land, air, space, sea. But it's just interesting because every breach today, no matter what, tar Target all the way to DNC to JP Morgan Chase, everything, is influential. People get fired now, it's kinetic, 
And everybody's worried. Like literally, you know, people don't know what to do with teenagers and DDoS is, right? You know, things like that. That's like, like crazy. So like everybody's kind of like, you know, it does play into a, an influence these days. Every single one, the more they get, the bigger they get, there's a big influence change. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with this. Lockheed invented it, which I don't understand. It's a piece of paper. But anyways, um, so the idea of it, though, is anybody here do forensics or incident response in the past, had to deal with breaches, blah, 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 right? So um, as you guys know, there are different models. There's also the diamond model based on an intelligence perspective. You know, there's different models. But this one is actually kind of cool. But I was even testing my demo breach today. I realized I'm starting with reconnaissance, and I go into this, and then I go back because I'm actually, that's part of my reconnaissance process. So it's not something you just go, oh, that goes in this pile, and that goes in this pile, right? If you start each moon over, sometimes it literally is starts over again, and then stops, and then comes back, right? So, um, but basically, when you look at this kill chain, it's actually going to be important because we're going to actually apply it to the demo today. Um, you know, the A and APT nowadays, the advanced, means reconnaissance. It just simply means they've cased the joint. They've studied, they've looked, they've done neurosynth, they've probably done other, some other stuff depending on who they work for. But they've spent, been on, and I actually, uh, you know, when I say reconnaissance, even part of the rep weaponization, weaponization requires reconnaissance. You need to know who you can attack and what software they're running, right? There's a lot of pieces in this. Uh, when you think about the JP Morgan Chase breach, they were looking at the system for at least three months before they went in, right? So that's kind of the thing, because today's breaches, you don't, you, the breach today is different than like the old school days. You don't want to actually get caught until it's after, after the fact, because you're actually going after data. You're actually trying to steal something. And some of it might be very large. So you have to really think through all of that, right? Um, so, and persistence, like I said, this stuff is all in that persistence area, uh, exfiltration here. Um, so we're going to kind of take you through uh, the demo, and I'm going to do kind of a reconnaissance phase. It's going to stop here because then it's going to be cool. I actually have a semi-zero day. I did start it figured out yesterday. Um, Google, if you're in the room, we still like you. Um, <laughs> it's not really that bad. It's just funny. Um, so we're going to go there. And then basically from that point, I'm going to go back again. And then we're going to basically get into basically installation of command and control. And we'll kind of like go from there. Um, so with that ado, I'm going to figure out how to do this. OK. So breach mission phase one is the reconnaissance piece. We have a company. Uh, it's I literally, you know, the, the work I had to do on this demo. <laughs> so I had to register domains for you. Uh, SC Magazine, I'll, I'll bill you guys later. No, um, but seriously, um, so we have company-stuff.click. They're a financial company. The story is they're a financial company um, that is a third-party supplier to multiple. So they have like securities, and, and but they actually focus on being secure about their you know stuff, but they have third parties, right? Big third parties, big clients, you know. Um, the motivator we're having is obviously money, finance, and the connection, uh, the network they have of their clients, right? Um, the initial recon we did, uh, again, not a big big company, was uh, we found this Brandon McAdmin. That's his name. No face. I was going to take a funny one of me and just like seeing it. No, it didn't work. Um, his job is system administrator, but when I looked further, his job was is not originally system administrator. He's doing it because it's a smaller company, and he's adding on to the fact that he has to do it, which is common in you know a lot of companies. Um, so his email, which I got off of you know Harvester, the, which is a real fun tool on Kali, and that's how everybody gets them days. It literally goes onto LinkedIn and figures things out or Google. Uh, is a B, 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 M, B admin at company stuff click. The MX record that belongs to that e corporate email is Google, which is common. We do use Google a lot to to uh, use uh, cloud email and stuff like that. So if the phase one objective is information gathering. So I'm actually going to do a technique that usually is used. I'm not going to do the typical story of oh we lobbed malware over there. Okay, okay, fine. People clicked. Got it. We got that, right? So people do that. I wanted to do something a little bit more specialized, um, which was focused on the idea that in reconnaissance mode and in advanced mode, your maneuver to lob something over doesn't mean you're trying to get in just yet, right? It actually means you might just be testing it, right? A lot of times that's how that's going to go. Because you got to remember, Gmail might say something and throw something at it or a wire at it, stuff like this. By the way, there's a really cool trick. If you are doing penetration testing and you need to do your fish tests and they have Gmail, Send yourself a bunch of them as they go in your spam. Just tell it it's not spam about 10 times, and you're going to get it over to that company. So um, machine learning. So, but basically, what's going to happen is we're going to kind of do a weaponization. And what I'm going to do is kind of a Google service exploitation. It's not really a problem with Google. 
it's more of the features of Google. And I've uh, actually reported a version of this two years ago for them. And uh, this one I just found last night, so I got lucky. Um, but we're going to just use it, and it's got like literally walkthrough. Um, so what it is, is the delivery was we're going to obviously send them a, uh, a Google security email. Uh, the exploitation is going to be misdirection. So we're going to use Google to actually cam camouflage our activity. And uh, so I'm going to do that really quickly. So let me go to that and bring this over to, I think this is it, or no, I don't know about that. Where did it go? Ah, there we go. OK, cool. So I'm going to show you a company. Uh, I've got to figure out how to use my mouse when I'm, <laughs> do we have an external mouse or no? no? All right. So let's see if this works. Um, where is, ah, ah, there you are. No. So this is company-stuff.click, very famous, well-known company. They have financial data stuff and buttons, so click away. Um, you know, so, um, so what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to go down a little bit. Secure and safe management of your critical assets let us administrate your financial systems. You know, so that kind of stuff. At your service, they have around-the-clock support. Our technicians are always standing by to assist you. Off-site storage, critical data, up-to-date. We stay up top industry trends so you don't have to. Customer-driven support, we won't call you names. So, um, so basically, it's just, you know, standard run-of-the-mill site. Um, everybody's got one of these, some of these days, right? So that's the uh, site we are targeting, right? So what I'm going to do is, I, uh, we were, we've assumed that I've got Brandon's email here. Um, so what we're going to do um, is we're going to be Brandon for half a second. And uh, I'm going to actually go to the next slide real quick and uh, show you that real quick. So. Um, so what we're going to do with this actual like weaponization attack is we're going to spearfish to Gmail's corporate account. So he's already got this in his inbox. We're going to assume he's already read that, blah, 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 blah. There's a section here that says, hi, recover email for your Google account. Someone was messing with your stuff, which is easy to trigger, by the way. Don't, don't recognize this activity. How many people have got one of those? Don't recognize this activity. Check it out, blah, blah, blah. And it takes you to security.google.com. You go through. You look at the logs. You hit done. Nope, nope, you're good. You're, nope, 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 nope. And then you hit done, and then move on, right? So he's going to click the pre preview your recently used devices because he is a sysadmin and it is the company email, right? Um, so what we're going to do though, I'm going to explain the attack now because it's actually uh, kind of fun. So this was uh, me being kind of a smart ass. So what we're doing is Google has trusted services. YouTube, Google+, sites.google.com. Uh, by the way, this, this thing, when you figure out how this works, is great for Rick Rolling. So just saying. Um, because it, it's great. It's like, what? So you just YouTube them to the Rickroll. So, and I hear he's coming out with a new album, so this is going to be even ex ep extra epic. So, so what we got is we're actually going to take, and it's hard to see, but it's actually going to HTTPS security.google.com settings, secure account, okay? And now, I don't know if you've ever noticed on like, the, when you go to your mail.google and you sign in, and it says continue equals at the end of the path, and it'll take you to you know, mail.google.com if it's that or whatever. But anytime you log in, it's, it's just a holder to say, where am I going after I log in? It's, it's part of their SSO process, right? So uh, I could put youtube.com. I could put, you know, um, what else do they got? They got so many things right there, these days. Now, um, they only do that only to internally to Google services. If I go HTTP test.com, that doesn't work. It's like, I'm sorry, this doesn't exist, right? And uh, so I needed to find an actual Google site that would allow me to throw JavaScript around, which I found one, Blogspot. So Blogspot in the templates allows me to, to, to modify those templates and throw JavaScript in there, which I did. So what I did, though, is I needed to find a way to get that, because Blogspot is not a trusted setup, because it belongs to the home users, and they have a different uh, isolation of that. Google's doing a good job. So what it does, though, is once you click on this, it logs into the real Google site. It will take the user, Brandon, to Google Security Review. We're going to go through that process. User sees nothing wrong, fills out settings. Now, I made it so that you can see this. I slowed down the code. We stop in the action, everything like that, for demo purposes, because it's just not fair if you don't. So um, the user clicks Done, and then user connects, clicks, continues to, and this is all within Google. It's fun. iframe to the sites.google.com. It's kind of an iframe model, some module. So I'm like, all right, that's cool. So I'm going to iframe to my Blogspot JavaScript site that I have, right? Because I couldn't do it from the continue piece. And then what it does is actually takes it off and I have a short URL somewhere else that actually all it does is send a kind of like pan op click. It sends those fingerprints. It gives me the IP. All I'm trying to get is his IP address and a few things about him. That's all information gathering. So then it goes in there and what it does to do after that, it redirects. It redirects back to mail.google.com. So once he's logged and done in, he goes back into his email. 
So we're going to pretend that you know there is no alert, but I'm going to run the alert so that you guys can see where the actual Google start begins and I begin. Um, and again, 10 point bonus for using all Google ser services to camouflage and exploit this. 15 if you Rick roll somebody. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to go back to here, and I'm going to act like Brandon, which is like you know kind of a cool thing to do. Um, I got to find. All right, now I got to find my mouse. All right, and so here's the actual site. So. As you see here, I'm going to do it to the point that this is like completely kind of awesome. Security.google.com. I purposely raised the fonts. I'm not that blind, by the way. So, um, so security.google.com. I go to the secure connection, verified by Google and incorporated. It is the Google site, right? So, um, I, if I close, I think if I close it, okay. So I'm going to sign in to start. We've already saved his password because that's how everybody does it, right? So he's logging in. So this is him right now. This is not me, right? But he, he received this fish. He check, clicks on it, and this is where he would end up. So he's got to sign into his account. And he's got to still, we're still, by the way, at Google.com, right? Time for security checkup. Uh, we put that in there because uh, obviously that. But we're going to skip this. Uh, check your recent security events. Uh, I live in Newark. Yep, that's good. Da, 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 everything. Um, the other guy who helped me with this demo lives in San Diego. He looks good. Um, we all use Linux. Notice that? I, I, I recommend a switch. Um, <laughs> looks good. All right. Check account permissions, Google Contacts, Mozilla Th Thunderbird. Oh, that's nice. All right. And we're going to hit done. Now, nicely done, we're going to hit continue. Boom. All right. Here it is. So I put, put, put a pause here. This is on site.google that is now iframing to my blog spot, which is then JavaScripting up. Recon scene activated. Now, in the real world, this would happen, and you would have not notice it. You'd just go back to Gmail, right? So, and back to Google. So, we're going to hit the OK button because you know it's cool, right? Now, because we have that new Flash vulnerability, this also could apply. So, anything goes here. If you do want to lob over malware or lob over an exploit, it, it, the breach perspective is easy. The good thing, though, is we've done this all in a trusted set. So, those rules of like, oh, trust the site and check the SSL and everything like that. I like these kind of attacks. They're beautiful. So. Um, Plus, we made him actually do some work. And it was all about security. Talk about the best camouflage you can ever have, right? So, um, all right, cool. So, sorry, it was really fun. I don't mean to brag, but that was a fun thing to work on this one. So, we're in his email. Yay! Da -da 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 -da. We're here. So, he's in his email, not us. But, but what did I get out of it? Ah, that's a good question. So, Mr. McAdam, we'll, we'll log out of this. You know, we don't wanna, um, so, I'm going to now go to, I have a little cool thing here. That's mine. <laughs> this is my uh, shorter roll that was hidden in there. Um, obviously, this mouse is going to be fun for this, but whatever. Um, okay, now we know all my Gmail accounts, so you can try this on me, see if I fall for it. Uh, <laughs> hey, man, I, I, I hate it when people are like, stop clicking links. I'm like, well, how does the internet work? Right? You know, so, I mean, yeah. So I'm like, I click links, okay? It's just, it's just going to happen. So. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll do that. So this is a little fun little toy um, called Messing Around. So I've got my Gmail hit here. And what this is, is this is actually does give me, it's a basically a web beaconing system, right? So I just wanted recon stuff. So I wanted to view what is that. I want his IP address, right? So this IP address I find out, and we're going to pretend in the demo, I find out that's his home IP address, blah, 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 because he checked it from home, da, 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 right? So we also know that he's running what I'm running, um, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But we, you know, we assume that in the, this case, this guy, we got his information, blah, 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 blah. So now we're going to pretend with this IP address that that's this IP address, right? Um, and we're going to actually go scan that because actually the way I'm looking at this breach is not your typical. I thought I'd do something fun this week. Given the issues of last week, I'm going to actually hack into some IoT. So which is a little bit different because it kind of like a lot of people talk about the target breach and this and that. And they're like, HVAC, well, it's kind of like that. Or the POS malware, you know, some of it's closer to that. So a lot of the times when you don't want to be like necessarily always obvious, some of the things, especially when you're still in early recon mode, it, you're still discovering, enumerating, figuring things out. Let's go a back doorway. No one logs into their home, home security. Now, when we look at like the DNCs of the world and all that stuff, a lot of the connections to the actual breaches there are not just because they went into the corporation. It is their, their home work contamination problem with their emails and such like that, which is just normal. I mean, I know we're all guilty of it, so it's not like, you know, um, that. I mean, the trick is, you know, S-MIME if you can, right? So, um, so, uh, so here we're going to go. So now I'm going to go, and I'm going to try to do this 
Wait, actually, I have to do one thing, though. Uh, it's really important. One sec. Actually, hold on. OK. All right, right there. And then hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I brought this out for a reason. I think it's on, right? I think it's on. Come on. Is it on? There we go. Hold on. Hold on. It's very important. Well, you know, this. Hold on. There we go. OK, ready? Are we ready, guys? We're ready. All right. OK. So I guess I can turn it down a little bit. These are good, by the way. If you, if you like the thing, JBL is pretty good. All right, we're going to break some stuff. So I'm going to try to do this with this wide screen here and stuff. And I may need to turn around so that I can actually act like I'm doing stuff here. Um, but <clears throat> so we're going to make, not make it all crazy complicated, but we're going to go into some of the things. All right, so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into the box that I'm using to hack things, which is likely five different thousand proxies to go into South Korea, North Korea, and every other person you want to blame. <laughs> so, because if first you don't succeed, you blame China, North Korea, or Russia. So, uh, all right, we're good on that. We're very happy about that, right? Oh, don't start with me on that piece. OK, so, all right, so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to put my terminal over there so we can see it. Um, Move to the monitor right. Let's see if that worked. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba uh, maybe. Maybe it's to the left. Ah, nope, nope, good. All right. Yes, this is classic hacker looking, but it's actually my normal day, so it's not like I posed up and just put that on there. Okay. Now I got to find my mouse, which is, seems to be the biggest trouble around here. Okay. So I'm going to close down some stuff here so that I have my newts, because obviously stuff like this takes some memory. Um, all right, come on. There we go. All right. So we're going to do this thing where I'm going to take that IP address, which is called target. Uh, not the target, but you know target. <laughs> I can't imagine the uh, threat intelligence for doing OSINT lookups on target. <laughs> Common word. <laughs> OK, anyways, so we have this IP address. I'm going to actually obviously scan it uh, real quick. So we all know an Nmap, right? We're all happy with that one. So um, you're like, no, I actually, uh, I'd rather pay for it. Um, <laughs> so it's scanning. It's scanning, and we're walking. We're, we're firewall walking. We're walking. OK, good. Now we have something here. We have a net gear. All right, typical. Sysadmin wants to, to remotely control his stuff out there, probably does movie stuff. You know how it goes with BitTorrent and all that, right? And all those grumpy, funny sysadmins. OK, so anyways, we got this all this stuff out here. So I'm going to basically assume that I took a bunch of stuff and started figuring out what version it was, all this stuff, you know, all the enumeration stuff. I don't want this demo to take forever. But you assume I have like a Metasploit kit and everything like this. It's getting all crazy. And I find out there is a vulnerability on this because it's slightly just one under a, 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 a um, thing. So. Netgear, by the way, nothing against Netgear. We purposely set this to be vulnerable. Netgear's been up to date. Just, you know, so nothing wrong with Google either. It's just, you know, it's funny. Um, so <clears throat> here we go. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually go into, let's see, uh, yeah, my sex stuff. Yeah, there we go. And uh, yeah, my Netgear. So we're going to assume that I have a, a pile of Netgear exploits here that I, all right, hold on. Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, yeah, see, I got a bunch of different ones, right? So we're playing that I have actually a bunch of these. Um, yeah. All right, cool. So then we, I find that basically there is this SOAP request that you can make that is bypassing the authentication, meaning that it should be as being the only request if it asks for uh, um, um, authentication, but unfortunately they overlooked that and it missed the actual authentication. But what's handy about that SOAP request is um, and so for, for those who don't know, it's kind of these are, it's basically RPC. It's a remote procedure call to get, have other uh, devices talk to each other, right? So, um, and a lot of times unused by everybody, but you know, they're hanging out there, right? So this actually is uh, not a very well-known um, vulnerability. So those who do not patch it in Netgear is probably like, you know, pops up a little bit. And so this is actually probably at least 30%, 40% on the internet. Still people with those Netgears that have anything that's showing up on the, like, you know, open. So. So what it's going to do is we're going to do um, uh, we're going to take the um, I think uh, I think that yeah we're going to do that and I hate that this guy wrote it in Ruby but that's that's another story guys um, but we're basically going to do this I think he wrote it designing for Metasploit or whatever so we're going to just take the target we're going to go port 8080 because that's the port 80 we found up here we're going to go hit oh my goodness oh that's cool the admin password is zombies are real. Uh, <laughs> 
Hmm. The guy who actually helped me set up all this stuff, he actually put password. I'm like, you can't do that. No one does that and has it open up on the other side and like as a sysadmin. There's just no way. So um, we also have the SSID, um, have a WPA key, which is kind of short, um, but basic serial number. Oh, and look at this. The neat part is there's an attached device because he likes to tinker, and it's a Raspberry Pi. I love Raspberry Pis. Anybody have a, their own Raspberry Pi play around with it? Yep. See? See, they're fun, right? You know, so. Is yours still default password because it's internal to your network? OK. But you know what I'm talking about. Very common thing because you're thinking, hey, he's, he's, he's Mr. Master. He's the master. Anybody needs a Raspberry Pi, talk to this guy over there. So, um, he's got three of them. No, that's what, that's what you were saying, right? <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times, because you know how you have it where it's like, oh, this is my internal home network, no one can get it in. I've got it on default device, I didn't even think about it, you know, blah, 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 because you're just like, oh, that's easy, I don't have to remember all that stuff, right? Common thing, right? So what we're going to do is take advantage of that a little bit. And so now I'm going to go back to here, and I'm going to go to, I am going to go to, I believe I am going to hit, yeah, I'm going to hit the net gear. So this is the net gear. The admin, and what was it? Zombies are real? Yeah. All right. I'm not going to re remember that. I don't need to. I'm going to look around, right? It's so pretty. I guess what? We could actually patch this and just get out of the system and end this whole breach now. But we're not going to do it. Huh? <laughs> Send him a bill, right? Um, <laughs> Reminds me of those India call centers and stuff like this. Fixed your virus for you. <laughs> if you don't send me a virus or money, I'm putting it back on, which is a combination of ransomware now. No. <laughs> okay, so basically we have all this internet. We have access to this thing. We have an attached device. That's the thing that's uh, funny and fun for me. Because if I have an attached device, it means that I can get it in possibly, right? Because I want the device. I want access to it. And the router is trusted because everybody trusts routers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go to the advanced because we all know Netgear is always port forwarding. is usually in the advanced setups and stuff like that. Never done this before. Um, so we're going to do that. <clears throat> and then I am going to set up a service, right? And I'm going to call it UNPN. It sounds like a common service. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an external starting port of 2222. And I'm going to external ending point of 2222. I'm then going to uncheck this. I'm going to make it uh, 22. I'm going to go like that with this attached device because it does all the work for me. Isn't that great? I don't even have to like remember the, the IP address. OK, cool. So we're adding that on. And so now we have port forwarding of UNPN at 22222. Now, what I'm going to go do is I'm going to go back to this, right? And I'm going to try to um, see if I can log in to, uh, all right, to the, t yeah, all right, good. So now I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to log in as, I think it's pi at uh, target uh, with uh, port 2222. Two. I hope I did it right, yeah. <gasps> nice! Of course, now you know I've practiced this demo right out, pop up with some SSH keys and say, hey, what's up? But Someone's got to practice you. So um, we're going to do the password of ra. How do you spell raspberry? <laughs> it's the rasp part that gets me. All right, got it. All right, so we're in because you know it's a typical move, right? So so we're going to assume here, not for for demo's sake, that I then make an SSH uh, version of a, a reverse connect so that I don't even have to go through the net gear. But the idea is now the breach, like where we're at in this phase, is I'm now exploring, right? So I'm actually going, okay, I'm on this home network. Now, how many times have you got your IRS you know, stuff on there or something? Some file from work, right? And your emails, right? So I'm going to look around, because now that the cool thing about this is that I'm sure with that, uh, I got root access on this because of the standard default setup, right? So the cool thing is I also have TCP dump access, which I'm not going to do because it's going to only repeat my SSH stuff. But um, I can do a lot of damage here. I can install programs, things like that. But what I want to do is I'm going to do like a net stat um, and see what's going on around here, right? So, um, uh, here we go. Let's see if this doesn't go too fast. But basically, um, I'm going to look at like kind of things he has running. So we have, oh, a few things up here, which is kind of cool. Oh, we have a, a web dab file system. OK, that's on the mount. One of the most common things in, uh, in Linux to do is look at your mounts, see what's on there, because if it's you new. Know. Um, by the way, I hate Avahi. I don't know why, but I usually shut it off. But anyways. Um, so then we're going to go, and we're going to type in mount. We're going to look at all this stuff. We've got the standard stuff. We can actually even do that, right? we got that. But then we got something here. 
this thing here. We got that. We got this. We got this. We got it. Oh, media web dev. What's that? Um, oh, look at owncloud.stuffs.download slash owncloud remote.php web dev. What if I click on that? <laughs> I wonder if that works. Hold on. I mean, can I copy uh, open link? Um, sure. Okay, cool. Now I got to figure out um, what that might be. So I know that he has web dev, which means that I'm knowledgeable of this because I'm not going to be an advanced persistent thread if I didn't know how to use a web dev, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into the web dev uh, setup. And uh, because I'm root, secrets doesn't really matter to me. Um, and look, it, oh, his name's Brandon. I just learned that again. And he obviously has the password of Johnny Bravo 1992, which is a fun show. It's a fun show. So, you know, I would have chosen Doctor Who if I was prepping this demo all the way. But that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Um, so we're going to try something here. And I'm only doing it this way for, for uh, reasons of um, visual, because down here you can also just go in the directory and get the same thing. But it's going to be fun, because when you do this, most of the time these things don't log very well either. So, Johnny, woo 1992. All right. This is a web dev interface, but I, I'm aware of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go like that. And guess what's cool? Um, by the way, I can also mess with this web dev interface, but we're going to do it again. Brandon, and we're going to do Johnny Bravo 1992. And here we go. And we're in. Oh my gosh, what a common thing to do. It is. It is. It truly is. <laughs> so imagine at the DNC one person, and then these emails somewhere goes along, and you're like, oh, geez, thanks for that password in that email. I'm telling you, almost every company does it, especially these small organizations that have to get put together, and they're like, oh, my gosh, we've got to move on this. And then they go away for four years, right? So <laughs> um, the, the funny joke is I actually got a job offer for the Hillary Clinton's like campaign thing, but the pay was not good enough. It's like nonprofit practically, so you're like, eh. So um, I'm a snob, sorry. But um, anyways, so we go into here. And this is a common thing a sysadministrator might do. And notice he doesn't tell us what the password is. He's just like, hey, this is my remote uh, you know, emergency server. I use normal password. So I'm going to obviously start figuring out what a normal password would it be for this guy. And obviously, we're going to try his other password, all right, which seems to be common for a lot of people, because people tend to just go based off of memory. So that's interesting, though, is that we have an emergency remote server called corporate.companystuff.click. So I am going to do, um, I think I could do uh, something like, I don't know. Um, let's see. I mean, I think I probably have it here. Nope. OK, nope. Um, basically, I'm going to end map it, but we're going to know what it's going to give me. So it's going to be in the RDP port. We won't waste the time end mapping. So basically, what we're going to next do is we're going to go, OK, let's try this out. So I'm going to then open up RDP. And we're going to go to that. Hold on. RDP. All right. And we're going to connect. And so what that is, is I need that IP address, which is corporate-companies-stuff.click. That's super cool. All right. If my mouse will work, I can hack better. <laughs> All right, so here we go. And we're going to try to connect this thing. Ew. All right, username. I know he gave us some information. Oh, we got a company domain. That just makes things so much easier. But I think it's what? B McAdmin. B McAdmin just like it was before. Um, normal password, let's try variants of Johnny Bravo. 1992, we're going to act like a bunch of things went on, and we figured that out. And oh my gosh, is it company stuff, dash stuff, which is, you know, blah, 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 blah. OK, so look at that. Now, this is the emergency standard RDP servers that people always have when they're worried they can't get in their company, right? So the cool thing about that is it probably doesn't do too much or anything like that, but it allows me to do some stuff. And so I want to kind of look around. Ooh, PowerShell, fun. You know, Windows made a fun move when they did that. It's like basically adding the power of Linux in Windows. And now you can't actually do any antivirus on this stuff because it's its own Turing language. So we'll get to that in a second. So I'm going to go around here, and I'm going to just check out the box. Right? So I'm going to say ipconfig-all because I'm just curious about how this thing's set up a little bit. Um, and it's got routes. Oh, it gets the internet. It's cool. It's got, wait, oh my gosh, this is way too weird. But anyways, we're going to skip to the end. And I'm going to go, oh, there's a DNS server. I wonder if that's an AD server too, right? Which it usually typically is because, it, uh, you know, whatever. So I'm going to try something. And I'm going to try it 
in a basic way first. We'll go to administrative tools. We'll go to computer management and just do the basics here. Um, I'm doing this the easy visual way. There's a lot of really cool command lines you can do with this or PowerShell. But um, then we're going to actually go basically over to, I don't know, connect to a remote computer. Um, and the other computer, I probably could browse for it actually. Um, what was it called though? Now I've got to remember. Um, so it was 4.9, correct? All right, 192.168.164.9. So let's try 192.168. Um, Double check. Ah, there we go. Oh, yeah. RDP. And one more time. Uh, 164.9. All right, 164.9. Let's try that out. Check the names. Let's browse it. All right. Um, okay, let's try that. Uh, company stuff. Uh, let's try this. Dash uh, 192, 164.9. Let me double check. <laughs> I keep forgetting the last number. Nine. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so hit OK and go OK. Uh, I'll try it with this one. All right, there we go. All right, da, 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 da. then we go like this. We try to connect. Um, then we go hit OK, and we go, and boom, we're looking like we're on another system, which is very handy because it's got the task scheduler. One of the biggest common exploits is PowerShell and task scheduler, so that's where you can hide nasty stuff in the task scheduler, and we can also like obviously control everything here, but let's see what's really important is that his password actually worked for the AD server. The question is, is it admin, right? So I'm going to try something different now that I know that this works. I am going to do remote from here, right? And the cool thing is, is uh, again, I can always set these back reverse shells and just connect directly to these things, but I'm going to try it. 192, I'm going to put it there and it actually did it for me and I'm still trying to forget it. Uh, we're going to try that. We're going to try what was it? Um, remember his password? Was it Johnny or no? Oh yeah, it was Johnny. Okay, that variant. Johnny Bravo, 1992, and here we go. Oh, oh, of course it's not trusted, but you know what? Today, I'm in the mood. All right. So the cool part about this is now we are on what it looks like to be the AD server, right? Which I can have a lot of fun with, right? So. Yeah, it's definitely the AD. Look at that, Active Directory Administrative. Now, almost every breach that you see that has a Windows environment hits the AD. That's what they're going for. That's the king of all things, right? So from this point on, um, the cool part about it is, of course, the first thing I would do is actually disguise myself as a service, as a username, because he probably doesn't even think to go on here very often. Um, I would also start messing with the PowerShell and start putting in, uploading a lot of my PowerShell code. Uh, and if you want to get crazy ideas, I'll show you, but basically we're going to talk about PowerShell in just a second. Um, but we can add domains. <laughs> we can uh, do sites and services. Actually, users and computers, let's start there, right? So I want to add a user. Um, okay, um, let's do that. Let's do that. Um, so let me add a user. Um, all right, here we go. Um, I don't even know how to add a user in Windows. I really don't use Windows much. Um, huh? Oh. Oh, it does have to say new. Okay, cool. Oh, okay, got it. I knew that. I knew that. All right, users. Or a shared folder. Let me just open something up, right? So, all right, obviously we know this, but I want to just look like, I don't know, service uh, request, right? Um, and so we're going to just do that, and we're going to be something like service. This is at company service, like blah, blah, blah. Kind of like what we've seen in a lot of these breaches. We saw this on one of the insurance breaches that just disguised itself as service. So, and then I can create my own crazy password, because I like to. And I don't know if I even password. Okay, finish. And, okay, so cool. And the cool thing is I can set admin, blah, 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 and I can go in there without having to mess with his account. Of course, I would do anti-forensics. I would delete all of his stuff, like make sure that it didn't look like it was in there, go in the event logs, take all that. I have administrative privileges, right? So, hey, thanks. Um, so moving on, um, we can pretty much go from anywhere here, because now I can go to control in the mail servers, which basically lives off the LDAP authentication systems. Um, I can basically pick off uh, you know, uh, everything I need, right? I can just pretty much run a cracker on here, LDAP, I'm done, and we're gone. So that is the end of this part of the story. Okay, so I'm going to get out of here, because you know it's just scaring me. <laughs> no, um, but basically, I'm going to show you what we kind of did, so that we see it from a network perspective. Um, and this one, too. All right, bye-bye. Okay, good. Um, let's just kill that. All right, so what did we end up doing? All right. Um, okay. 
So where is, ah, here we go, here's my slides. Nice, okay, so back in here. So this is almost done now. So what did we just do? Basically, so that everybody knows from more of a heart thing, I swear I'm almost done, you guys can get your drinks, I promise. <laughs> This is another lifelike drawing of me. You saw the early one earlier, right? So this is me doing the fish to the Gmail, the cool little trick with my little hack and semi-zero day. IP address to home and net gear. You know, we found that. Basically, we're taking a slow roll. We're going to act like this went and happened over months. You know, things like that. Like, we're going to pretend that it took a while for me to find some company work stuff. I'm going to go in there maybe an hour a day, kind of keep an eye on it, make sure he's not seeing it. I'm going to erase logs, bleach bit, all that fun stuff. So I'm going to break into the home router. I set my port forward as I keep checking those. I come in and have an uh, automated script that'll make sure I have one. If it goes down, I make another one. These are the things that I will do for persistence, right? So in there, I've got the attached device. I live in that Raspberry Pi. That Raspberry Pi is me, is, I'm Brandon from that Raspberry Pi, which is awesome. And I have a full Linux environment, which is really cool, right? Personal on cloud, we take care of this because it's basically his data store. It's this NAS, right, basically. Um, we're going to pretend we've found a bunch of movies in there so that if he tells on us, we're going to go to the DMCA and, you know, all that fun stuff. So anyways, um, then we basically, what we did was get the passwords to the RDP remote corporate emergency sensor because even if it wasn't that exact password, we, you know, would do a try, try, try. It's going to be something near it. Uh, if not, I would have tapped the wire, forced a, like a, a rundown and get something off there. RDP um, emergency remote server uh, corporate. And then the cool part about that is that gave us access to the admin access to the Active Directory, which pretty much gives us the access to the entire office network because we can go laterally in there. Once you have access to that, we go into the accounting services and we look at the client list. We find out all of these other things. And now we are that third party company that's small that is broken into Target or whoever it is, right? You know what I mean? Sorry, Target. Um, <laughs> um, and um, all hackers use that stamp, so we stamp the place as we leave. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things, though, that's very interesting, how many people deal with PowerShell in, in their environment, things like that? It's an extremely useful tool, I, I think we admit. But we also admit that it is one of the most interesting tools because you can't really solve a uh, signature of antivirus with this. I've literally seen, and I wanted to do a whole thing on this, but it's super technical, but obfuscation where they're hiding it, like malware is literally, they're using the registry as storage to actually hide malware to collect later, pull, and, and it's all obfuscated. It's like literally like all these different variables. Yeah, and the cool thing, I love the debugger. The debugger is awesome. So basically, but it's a native tool in Windows, and it's awesome because it's given that Windows kind of that, that true server power, that Linux, that Unix feel, right? Um, you can even type ls, it's really great. <laughs> so, uh, greatly misunderstood. A lot of people do not understand the power of this because it is a full-on Turing complete language, which means that it is powerful as C, Python, anything that basically can do uh, that. So it is a programming language within itself, right? Um, giving you access, if you have the right, uh, you know, privilege escalation, to everything you want in the Windows 32 API, which is kind of awesome. That includes crypto, by the way. So, um, make your own PowerShell ransomware today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't write to disk, which is awesome too, because basically you can do in-memory work, which is even faster if you think about it. That's why it doesn't write to disk in a lot of ways. It uh, basically has signed processes that it actually executes through us, again, hiding itself through its processes. This is a big problem, right? We see this a lot. Uh, it allows remote reflective injection into DLLs. If you want to find out how, go to PowerShell Mafia at GitHub, and it has literally an entire framework on this stuff. Um, <coughs> but it's not a vulnerability. It's a language, right? So um, the interesting thing, remember the threat model, it's a little smaller this time. Shows you how I feel about it, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I wanted to go through the idea of the PowerShell attack capabilities. Um, I was gonna give you all this crazy stuff, but I realized how late it is. So from a recon perspective earlier, now we're on this box. Now we have another reset of the kill chain. I gotta go recon this entire office network. Right? I'm going to build tools there. I'm going to have all these things. And if, if you look at like any system, there's going to be hashes everywhere. <laughs> so, but I can hide myself a lot without having to do much with writing malware. So the cost is low for me if I know PowerShell. Right? And so I can port scan with PowerShell. I can do HTTP statuses. I can find servers, basically. Uh, I can do reverse DNS, look up system details. I can weaponization. I can invoke, invoke shell code execution. I can do it in, by basically injecting into DLLs, injecting into PEs. I can do basically full-on Windows management instruction commit, like commands. Uh, I, can do dis I can destroy the MVR record. But make sure you add a payload of charging people before you do it. Um, elevated persistence. So we go back into this little here over here. We got permanent uh, uh, Windows management events. 
We can do stuff where we can actually take advantage of the scheduled tasks and make exploits run there or timed malware, logic bombs. We have registry uh, storage, like I said, we can hide everything there. Um, and everything can be obfuscated, by the way. These obfuscations are kind of normal. Um, and so it's very hard. So if someone's not really good at PowerShell or if they're just getting their hands around and they see this, they're like, what the heck is just going on, right? So, and then log on trigger, you can actually trigger payloads, just like we did with the net use back in the day where you have like batch files. Now you can do it at the, the PowerShell level. Escalation, misconfigurations allowed, DLL hijacking and vulnerable services, obviously. You can just do everything there. Exfiltration, there's already tools out there to do this, so this is proven. Key logging, password theft, token manipulation, and process dumping. When you think process dumping, I'm also talking about memory, which is nasty. So. Um, I realize I have this. So once inside, I think we all kind of understand this, but once inside, the biggest problem is, and when people talk about it, it's like, it's not just the machines, it's, it's an issue of trust mechanisms, right? Trust is a relative concept, right? I trust you today, you trust me tomorrow, blah, 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 blah. But in the world of these roles and access, this, this is hard. You're dealing with humans, and you're trying to keep, give a finite state of trust within a human and might have a bad day or a good day today or tomorrow, right? You know, and the next day, he's snowden it up, right? So it's going to be a term. We'll start something. Uh, so don't be snowden it up in here, bro. Uh, so uh, I don't want you Bradley manning this place, man. No, um, so, um, so basically, it's, a lot of it is just hard to manage trust. And IAMs are obviously where it's going. Uh, a lot of it's not understood. People are people too, right? The mistakes. Your biggest operational security or OPSEC mistakes are not purposeful. They're usually, ah, oh, crap, right? Um, uh, I run OPSEC at Flashpoint. Oh my gosh, it's a nightmare. And it's, it's not that we do it wrong or right. It's just people make mistakes. And you're like, ah, oh, crap. And then you got to call them out and they got to be like, okay with it. And it's, you know, it's like all this thing, right? We have to look, work out that people positive thing. We call it Flashpoints. So, um, <laughs> So basically, the, the funny thing is, is that the goal would, though, is that once they're in, the assumption here is that once they're in this zone, right, so you got the targeted server, they got through this, and this is like basically like, let's say it's the DNC and the email system. They've got access to all of these pieces, these devices. They can fly out, everything like this. But basically, any of these devices can play off of it. And now with all this peer-to-peer -peer stuff going on, you never know how often if they're actually going to start assuming, hadooping the load of, of, of the exfiltration stuff that's coming out. And then basically, next thing you know, that's when it matters. The WikiLeaks, the Alpha Bay, all the crap that hits there, right? Um, but the idea is to isolate. Obviously, um, as much as I could say anything more than basically go back to the 90s and the basics of understanding your, uh, you know, how to isolate important networks and such. I mean, that's basically when you look at no, any crypto model or any new architecture, it's always like isolation first, right? How are you protecting the DB? How are you protecting that? that um, you obviously reduce the attack surface, so if you can figure out that they're in there, isolation plus obviously host NIDs, all these other pieces, standard removes. But the impact is actually influential and kinetic. So why are we so vulnerable? One of the reasons why is that we are still in the castle state. When old school castles, back in the, I don't know, whenever, before gunpowder was invented, we had castles, and we were the king of the, the crop of these castles, and you know, arrows just kind of bounced off, and we could live in our castles and kick butt in wars. And then, we are in the stage where gunpowder is invented. And now we're seeing, uh, you know, we're, we're sit still in that defensive mechanism of, oh my gosh, we're, our castles are crumbling. And we've been building our defense systems in this way for a long time. Well, how do we get agile? We're all standing still. And it's hard to say, because I mean, it's, like, it's almost like saying I can stand in front of that building and throw a rock at it. It's not really fair, right? The building ain't going to move. It's going to take five years to do that, right? So, um, so it's almost like this zero sum game in that sense. But layer eight is the, the biggest problem these days. You are the weakest link. Even the system administration and our guy here, he was the weakest link. Uh, the human layer, the interactive layer, it's like you, you're dealing with psychological behavior, right? So you, you're gonna click, I'm gonna click, everybody's gonna click on something, right? So a lot of it's, it really comes down to the, uh, a behavioral issue here, uh, which you can't really fix in that sense. But what you can kind of do is obviously try to figure out how to isolate or detect or pick those things up or also uh, across the board build out a culture that is okay with positive reinforcement of a security mistake. Because a lot of times that negative mistake is why people don't say anything. You know how many people actually secretly pay for ransomware and they don't tell anybody and they lie about it? Because they don't know that, they, that it's a positive thing to report it. They think they're gonna get in trouble and fire, right? So it's the same problem here. And computer users are just users. That's like saying, hey, you know what? Uh, if I'm a, a NASCAR driver and I expect the same results of some guy on the road, like, come on, man, no, it's, he's just a car driver. I, you know, so, uh, so it's the same thing as basically carjacking. They don't know what to do a lot of the times. Uh, hurting humans <laughs> are difficult. Uh, and then basically when you think about it from a peer-to-peer -peer or distributed perspective, it is, it, all it takes is one out of K nodes to make a mistake, right? So 
one of the obviously sets from this lesson here is don't run systems of local admin. Lock down PowerShell and manage its activity. Don't use it if you don't understand it. Um, <laughs> Isolation, isolation, isolation. When you think about a threat model, a lot of people take a, like a year to, to do it, and if you're paying a million dollars for a piece, a bunch of pieces of paper, that's not how you do it. It's simple. Information, secrets, actors. Right? What that means is, what's the information? Where's it flowing? How's it, you know, actually, you know, where's it going? Right? What are the secrets? How do I manage those? Where are they going? How are they key managed? How, how is that? And how do, when do they actually float up to the top and have to be used. Who are the actors? Now the problem with people's threat models today is they want to deny that themselves are also a possible actor of like, oh, we could, what this doesn't serve or what we cannot do in our limitations. I knew that, that was something, whatever. But basically we have to like focus on Alice, Bob, uh, Charlie, you know, Mallory, um, you know, uh, like all the way down to like someone making a mistake, things like that. So, so when we think about it, it's information secrets and actors and it really comes down to incident readiness. You're going to get hit, you're going to get hit. Can you, can you minimize, can you move on that? It's business continuity. When people ask me about ransomware, it's the same thing. Well, do you have a business continuity plan for a server dying? Okay, well, that's the same plan, right? Same, same thing, it's just like kind of that. So Brandon's mistakes in his case, so we just know. Password reuse, corporation, corporate on his personal domain. I use SMIME in our, our corporate email. It's internally, it's a big thing. It's a pain in the butt, uh, managing it a little bit, but actually once it gets going and stuff like that, we've, we know that like, most of our emails internally are encrypted. So if someone hacks in our you know, email system, we're not you know, sitting out dry. Is it perfect? No, but it's a lot, a lot better step into that. And culturally, we've all, like, even our marketing, our sales team are all required to use SMIME, and, and it's working because it's, it's getting to that point where it's somewhat seamless. Um, you know, he stored work in on a, 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 basically in an insecure manner. His homework contamination kind of played into that. Uh, patch management failures. In his world, it's too disruptive. It's just, you know, which is a common excuse. Um, plain text auth instead of assert based auth for own cloud. That was just dumb, right? So, and no two factor if you hadn't noticed that, right? So, um, so these are kind of the things that. Uh, Good. I hope this helps. This you. concludes uh, SC Congress Chicago. Please remember to fill out your feedback forms and turn them in. And thank you.